Well, hello, this is Peter Combs from Bitamount.com and P.O. Combs Asian Art in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And today is October 3rd. Uh, as many of you know, we did a video yesterday on the uh, auction results from the Asia Week in New York in September. And I had said at that time we wanted to get this video up for the uh, upcoming sales in Hong Kong. Um, uh, it's primarily focused on Sotheby's. Christie's has a sale. They have their their, their, their regular sale there. But it's a, a small sale. Good things. Nothing wrong with it. But the Sotheby's uh, series of auctions is going to be a real uh, test of the market, to put it mildly. Um, I, I don't think they've seen this much great material turn up all at once in a sale probably for the last six or seven years. Uh, the material, this is going to really test the upper end of the uh, Chinese porcelain and uh, jade uh, and bronze market. There's some amazing material in here. And we're going to go through some of them. This is There's a lot of material. It's absolutely unbelievable. And we're going to start with this, the Chinese uh, important private collection of Chinese ceramics. Uh, it, 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 it runs everything from uh, early ceramics right through uh, in the imperial pieces of the uh, uh, Qing dynasty, uh, mostly in the Qinlong, Yongchen, and Qinlong period. But uh, we're going to get started right here. And one of the pieces that struck me right away was this. This is a wonderful uh, Liao vase. Uh, it is superbly well done. It's a Ding Yao example. It's about, uh, how big is this thing? It's pretty good size. It is 14 inches tall, but the quality of the glaze on this is just absolutely amazing. Um, it is completely even, uh, pretty much just perfect all the way down. There's a couple of minor boo-boos here in the glaze, but that's about it. And uh, it's got a pretty hefty estimate of uh, 255 to $383,000. And uh, how that does will be a, a very nice uh, sort of test of, of that period, uh, how they're doing these days in China. It's a, it's a great example, however, um, if, if, you, if you enjoy monochromes. And then you get over here, there's a fantastic Ding Yao boy pillow. Uh, it's about seven inches in diameter, as most of them are. It was produced during the Jin Dynasty. And uh, it's carrying an estimate of three hundred and eighty-three to five hundred and thirty thousand dollars, or five hundred and ten thousand. But again, superbly well glazed, uh, a lovely example. The the top of it is all you know has impressed decoration and so forth in it. The facial expression on the boy is quite nice. Um, there's a little bit of firing uh, issues down here around the bottom. But that is fairly typical on these. There's always a spot or two. But overall, it's one heck of a piece. And um, that'll be getting off the block, hopefully, uh, uh, without too much trouble. And then on to this. this. This piece is somewhat of a mystery to me. And a few people have commented on the forum over on, on Bitamount. Uh, it's a Yuan a, a jar, a big, a big, beautiful horse jar. Uh, unbelievably, uh, unbelievable high-quality decoration on this. I mentioned it a few weeks ago because I was, I'm very surprised by the estimate. I haven't seen a condition report on it. And I, I almost have to just assume that this, this piece has had maybe had a restoration or something. Or, the, or this, the seller is signaling they want it to sell no matter what. Because uh, I think this is t these pieces typically sell for into seven figures. And this has a two hundred and eighty dollars to $350,000 estimate. It's good size. It's about 14 and a half inches tall. The cobalt toning on this is just splendid. Uh, just really, really the very, very, very best. And the horses are uh, superbly well done, each of them in these rue head lappets running around the shoulder. Uh, they all have, you know, different poses. And then, then you have the scrolling flowers, peonies underneath, and then the lappet base at the bottom. It's got everything going on. So we'll see how that does. I, I, but I, I want, I'm very curious to hear from anybody if they know, it, has it been repaired or is, is something going on that's not evident in the photos? Um, because that's that's a heck of a rare thing. And then get over to this, a really great inscribed uh, crackle glazed uh, figure of a Guan Yin Wan Li period. It's dated 1615. It's got a complete inscription on it. It's good size. It's uh, what the heck is this thing? I forget. It's like 16, 18 inches in size. This is a big one. And uh, again, uh, absolutely superb glaze on this thing. Ab absolutely perfect. Um, when you look down this, and uh, it was done, as it says, it's dated to the Wan Li period, but the folds and the waves and the fingers and everything are uh, just, you know, it's, it's an amazing piece of ceramic. And, and this is sort of what you're going to be seeing through this whole series of sales. 
um, uh, right down uh, to the very end. Then you have this, an incredibly rare yellow phalanchi uh, uh, black marked Kung Shi bowl. These were made in the in the uh, in the in the ateliers of the Imperial Palace that Kung Shi set up. Um, initially, before they were applied blue marks, they applied black marks, and uh, this this type of bowl uh, was produced there, uh, meticulously drawn, beautifully done. There was a lot of influence on the decorations of these pieces um, by uh, foreign uh, uh, Jesuits and so forth. Matteo Ripa wrote about it, and the pattern you typically see on these bowls are either flowers like this or uh, more landscape scenes. But uh, this is one heck of a rare example, and uh, it's got a it's got a big estimate of five hundred and ten to seven hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars. It measures about uh, what is it four or five inches in diameter? Five inches in diameter. All right, and uh, the, again uh, another extreme rarity. This whole say all these sales are just filled with extreme rarities. It, it's it's and it, there's there's four. Um, five catalogs of them, and then get over to this a really spectacular Yongshen uh, uh, covered uh, uh, you know Daosai bowl with dragons on it, um, a, a very very rare piece, uh, superbly well done. I urge you if if you like if you like Daosai enamels or you're a real fan of glazes, um, uh, come over to Bitamount and find the catalog because you can zoom in just like this. And you can really study the piece because it's it's crucial to understanding what they should look like if you if you're always uh, you know uh, trying to authenticate things. Uh, but the the way this one is done is just uh, s uh, superb. And there's a very nice shot of the top, um, and I love the way they did the dragon, the green enameled face of the dragon, the red tongue, and then the blue wisps of uh, of the mane coming off, and these beautifully drawn scales. And then, and then the uh, outlining, just, uh, just absolutely great. And this fantastic soft blue uh, that they used uh, uh, around the flames and so forth, uh, just quite, quite beautiful. And it's got a big estimate. This thing is, this thing has got a pretty good estimate. Whoops, has an estimate of. Um, let's get back over to it. I closed it by mistake. The estimate on this is 153 to 230 thousand dollars. It's not a crazy estimate, so we'll we'll see. It's a but it's you know all of the estimates seem. Um, it's funny. Some of the estimates seem oddly low, and other estimates seem um, a little bit on the stiff side. So uh, I'm not sure what's going on. I think I think some of the sellers that are um, selling their collections really want them to sell. And then you have another Dao Sai uh, bowl. This is a a sun, we call them Sandwao bowls. But the uh, decoration on this is equally superb. It's estimated at three hundred and twenty-nine to four hundred and forty-nine thousand dollars. But if you come over and look at it and take a very close look at the uh, drawing of this bowl, the way the pomegranates are drawn, the way the leaves are gently outlined, and the uh, fantastic shading of the enamels, and then this perfect shape, the way the bowl is formed, just absolutely perfect. Um, and uh, it is about uh, what is it, about six or seven inches in diameter, a heck of a thing. All right, and now I don't mean to go fast, but there's so much here I, I <laughs> kind of have to, or I'll be here until midnight. Um, okay, and then you get onto this this rue type vase. It's a uh, uh, Chinlung period. It's marked, of course, uh, beautifully done. And the color of this is often referred to as uh, as Claire de Lune. Um, but it, when you when you pull in this piece and look at it, they did such a great job photographing it. You can you can see the very 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 fine crackle in the glaze and how it patterns. And uh, when you when you scroll down this piece, uh, you see how even the glaze is, which is a real difficult task with using light colored glazes because you you'll see any perfection will push push through. And you can see here how the glaze ran just slightly thin on the uh, edge of the foot just above it, and then you ends perfectly, perfectly neatly at the bottom, and you have this little bit of iron oxide line on the lower edge, which is typical. But be careful, because that is not always a sign of authenticity. Uh, you do see them on authentic pieces, but um, the fakers in China these days are, have are become very adept at coloring these feet with the right color um, uh, to, to to convince you that the piece is old, that alone is not enough. To, you know, an iron oxide line is never enough to date a piece, not even close. Okay, now let's uh, head over to uh, page 122. I have a list here beside me. This is really something. This is a European subject matter imperial workshop uh, uh, 
uh, vase uh, done, you know, Beijing enamel. It's about 14 inches tall. Uh, just absolutely superb. Really, really superb. And uh, you can, of course, pull it in and get a good look at it. And it's got great gilding, raised gilt work all around it with Famille Rose enamels painted in. You have this nice sort of Rococo uh, uh, scene around the outside and this figural uh, European landscape of a lake and a gentleman on the shore, boats and castles in the background. Just uh, really wonderful. And if they, they even provided this picture. Uh, they, they did a great job with the photography. Sotheby's really went out of their way this time. And uh, fantastic detail of the, of the mask and the gilding. And note the condition of the gilding. It's all intact, beautifully done. And this is a good-sized pot. And this was also done in the Imperial Atelier at the palace that was it was that that workshop expanded it was started by kung shi in the late 17th century and then it expanded um, during the yong chen period and, and and even more so in the chen lung era um, they got into making all kinds of stuff and this has an estimate of uh i didn't mention the estimate 381 to five hundred and ten thousand dollars. But uh, European workshop scenes, because the, uh, the Chin Lung Emperor was fascinated by Europe, and as, as we've discussed many times, the Jesuits and so forth that were in, in uh, 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 the Imperial Palace that had befriended the, the, the emperors, um, you know, had quite a bit of say about what decorations were done. They, they brought in enamels, colors uh, from Europe for the Chinese to develop, and so forth. So that, that's uh, just a classic example, and we'll see how it, how it goes, all right? And the rest of the catalog is equally great. Uh, you can flip through it. There's, there's altar sets, and uh, uh, there's a whole big write-up on altar sets. Lots of very fine Famille Rose, lots of blue and white. Uh, this is all 18th and uh, 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 late 17th century material. And then to hop over here, this is important Chinese art. Now, Nicholas Chow did a video on some of these porcelains, um, and uh, I'll link them in the, in the description below. And if you haven't seen it, we did have it in the newsletter last week. Uh, but this is a, the cover lot is, is, has a lot of people talking because there's only, uh, I think, around three of these pieces known. And, um, but there are some other really great, great, great examples. And uh, one of them is this Prunus and Ling Shi bowl. And uh, if we pull it up, uh, you can see how great, the, how great it is decorated. Really, really fine with the Ling Shi with all these different colors in it and the Famille Rose flowers and so forth. This bowl is estimated at $1.5 to $1.9 million. Um, it last passed through. It's got, it's going to get a lot of attention because the last time it sold it in a public auction was in May of 1982. And they, 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 uh, they did provide some uh, nice pictures of it. And then we get over to this. Uh, this is one of the main events of the of the whole week. It's estimate on request. I believe uh, 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 Sotheby said the estimate is in the eight to nine million dollar range, and it's an extremely rare um, envoy decorated blue and white dragon bowl, uh, marking period of Jinde period. Okay, it is a great rarity. Uh, uh, it is. These are not very big. Uh, some people think they're big. They're not. This is only about six inches tall. But the decoration on it is incredibly fine, and they, they did these, uh, back at that time, they learned to do this very soft blue backgrounds of waves, and then a second layer of a darker uh, image like this with the dragon over it, and down at the bottom there were some rocks and so forth. But it's just a, a really, really superb piece. Um, and there are more pictures leading up to it here. There's a very good shot of the foot. If you like to look at feet, if you're one of the people that like to learn about things on the, on the foot rims, there's a great shot of the foot rim of this piece. And you can really look up inside and see how dense the, uh, uh, the, the glaze got with that greenish blue color. You can see there's a slight skip in the glaze there, revealing a little iron oxide on the paste and so forth. But what a thing. Just a great thing, and it, it, every, a lot of people want to see how this does. All right, and now we're going to hop along over to uh, number page 70. There we go. All right, this thing, this pot. Um, this is a historic uh, uh, inscribed uh, pot. Uh, it is Chin Lung period, and it's the Hui Mountain Retreat. It's known as the Hui Mountain Retreat uh, uh, pot with a poem on the back. The Emperor Chin Lung... And a lot of prior emperors uh, were fans of the water that came from Hue Mountain, okay? And uh, they would go there and drink tea from it and have it prepared for it. And the water was always boiled in a very ancient pot. 
and there's an inscription on the back, a poem, an ode to the water here. Uh, Chin Lung, as many of you know, was a huge fan of tea. He was a tea aficionado, and um, this is this was uh, something that was done in uh, dedication to him. Um, it, it looks the decoration looks like it might have been done in the, uh, during the time of Tang Ying. I suspect it was uh, really really uh, lots of use of greens, beautifully done. And uh, here's a picture of the top, and so forth. All right, that's a, a fantastic example, extremely rare, and it's estimated um, at uh, 1.5 to 1.9 million dollars also. And it's largely due, to, of course, to the inscription and the historic context of the poem about the water and, and Hawaii Mountain and, and so forth. So uh, there's a very good write-up. All, all of these pieces, or many, many of them, have great write-ups by Regina Crowell and, and the crew over there. And they are highly educational and worth reading. Okay, so if, if, you, if you haven't, um, if you haven't uh, uh, had a chance to see them, you should. Okay, you should take the time to read them. Very informative. Now let's hop over to uh, da, 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 da. there. We go. This this is not an extremely rare thing. It's not marked, but it is a really fantastic Ming Dynasty moon flask with a garlic head on it. Uh, it's 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 uh, got a, a it's got a high estimate five hundred to seven hundred sixty five thousand. Because of the form and glaze, the form is based on a Middle Eastern metal form, um, which were brought into China. But the glaze on this is just stupendous. It's got this sort of soft cafe au lait glaze with uh, multiple uh, types of crackle in it. Um, beautifully, very strong looking pot. Very strongly done with these broad black crackles coming across the middle. And then, uh, then lighter crackles and even lighter crackle beyond that. Just beautifully done. You can see the edge of the foot rim on the bottom, but uh, an extremely rare thing. Um, and even though it's unmarked, it's carrying a big estimate because of its its, its rarity. And um, I can see why everybody likes it. it. The last time it was sold, let me see, uh, it was sold at Sotheby's about 10 years ago. All right, 12, well, 13 years ago now. All right. A lot of the stuff in here has been sold before through the auction houses, but a lot of the material has, has some of the pieces were auctioned last during the 1980s, um, which makes a, which makes a big difference because people get a little tired of seeing the same pieces turn up in auctions all the time. All right, even on the most desirable pieces, and then there is this the unbelievable pair. Uh, you you see these you see these Dao Sai uh, uh, Tibetan type Chin Lung uh, ewers from time to time, but you hardly ever see them in pairs. Uh, pairs of them are extremely rare, and the decorations on them are just absolutely superb. Uh, jewel, you know, the enamels are almost jewel-like, just really fantastic. And to have a pair of them is, is quite a feat. These measure about seven inches tall. They're not big. Some, sometimes they seem like they might be bigger, like a big ewer, you know, 12 or 14 inches. They're not. They're fairly small. But these are estimated at 765,000 to a million. All right. But if you're a Dao collector and you like Tibetan Buddhist ritual art and so forth, um, I don't know when you're going to get to see a pair of these again. There's no background on these. these, these, these all this stuff is coming from a private collection. And um, so where they may have been inherited, nobody really knows. They're, they're, they're not talking about it. Okay. And now on to the, oh, the Tang Dynasty glass bowl. This is an incredibly rare thing. And there's a very good write-up in here on this. Um, the Chinese were not terribly proficient at making glass for a long time. But during the Tang Dynasty, they did make a few. And this is, this is uh, as far as, I, from what I could read, the only known example okay, of, of Tang glass. It's about a foot tall. It's a ritual piece. And uh, there's examples in here of other glass. And they found a painting. This is really fantastic. On a, on a, on, on a wall. Um, of one of these. They believe this is one of these bowls that was made during the early Tang Dynasty. And this, this particular one, came, uh, it's a kneeling bodhisattva holding a large globular bowl, probably glass. The northern wall painting um, in, in the western niche of the Magao Caves, okay? Uh, early Tang, and this, this came from uh, the uh, Duanhong Academy in China had a copy of this photo. But there it is. And you, you, these these glass bowls are pretty much unknown. Um, uh, the Chinese, as I said, didn't make a lot of them. It was a diff for some reason they had a great difficulty with them. And this is estimated at 500 to 765,000. And as we saw last week, with great great rarities, they're hard to estimate. 
So I'm not sure how they estimated it. Maybe a gut feeling. They had a lot of probably a lot of talk about how to estimate this thing, because they they can't cite another one um, that sold at any time uh, recently. This sold last in April of 1985 at Christie's. All right. So you'd have to go back and look at that, and then and then do some serious calculating. So we'll we'll see how that does. All righty. Now, uh, da, 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 on to page 206. This, this lacquer table, an unbelievable Zhendi um, Ming Dynasty lacquer table. But the condition of this thing is absolutely amazing. Uh, it measures about 18 inches long and, uh, you know, seven or eight inches wide. But the condition of the lacquer looks, looks brand new, okay? Even underneath, under here, you don't see any signs of wear. It is in pretty miraculous condition, frankly. Um, and they've included some other pictures of the top uh, over here, there. So you can get in very close and see what these early Ming lacquer pieces look like. But the, the carving is stupendous. Uh, the good deep, deep uh, carving with, with, mi with minor background, crosshatch elements and so forth. And um, it's carrying a hefty estimate for sure. Uh, uh, let's see, what do they have on this? They have 765,000 to a million. But it's absolutely perfect, okay? And that, that goes a long way these days, especially if it hasn't been messed with. So uh, we'll see how that does. And then we get over here. This is, this is you know, this is almost sensory overload. There's a whole, if you're, if you're a big bronze, if you love bronzes and you like gilt splash bronzes of the Ming Dynasty, uh, get, a, get yourself a copy of this catalog if you can, because in, in this next section, it's a private collection of these things, and it goes on and on and on. And there's some really great examples, like this round one is a rather rare one. It's beautifully done. I love the masks on the ends. They all have Ming marks and so forth on them. Um, there's more of them, and there's this one with the, with the great looking, these very architectural handles coming off the side. Uh, and then this one here with the loop handles and the, and the rebus, you know, the uh, bosses running around the shoulder, um, lots of gilding, uh, nice feet with, the, with these sort of interesting um, volutes on them. Just, you know, it just goes on and on and on. So if you're, if you're a fan of uh, early bronzes, Ming bronzes, not any archaistic ones, but Ming dynasty bronzes, nice early ones, come and uh, spend some time looking through here because there are examples in here um, that will let you really see the texture of the gilding and how it's applied. And then you get over to things like this, this incredibly rare uh, Yixing slip decorated uh, brush pot um, signed Qing dynasty, Qin Lung period, um, superbly well done, of course, and has an estimate of uh, fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars. I, I have a feeling it's going to get through that. I don't know why, but I just do. People love those things. And then over to the next page. This really, I, I hope this isn't too much for everybody, but you have this: um, a fantastic Qing Dynasty jadeite of Quan Yin with a horse. And uh, what's really great about this piece is is the way that the carver so perfectly took into account the different colors in the stone when he was carving it. So you have these highlighted green areas on her, her left arm, and the rue scepter top uh, is, 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 has this beautiful amber tone to it. And going down, um, you have these striations of, striations of color, and the tips of the robes are turning brown a little bit and so forth. Just a great example. And this is a pretty good size Quan Yin. I think it's like 13 inches or something, 11 inches tall. It's got a $153,000 to a $230,000 estimate, but a really, really pretty uh, package. Um, uh, they don't date it too precisely. You may, you may notice this. They just say late Qing. Uh, the main reason is the jadeites are notoriously difficult to, to date, and they have to do it um, almost solely on stylistic considerations. So... Um, they do their best they can with it, but you're, you're basically paying for a piece of carved jewelry, all right? And then on to the next piece, and this is an item that got its own catalog, the enam an enameled jewel. And again, this is a piece of glass. And this particular piece of glass has a rather amazing history, um, uh, and there's a, this is, there's a long write-up in here in this catalog about it. Um, you, you have to see this thing to, to, to believe it. Uh, this again was made at the Falang um, uh, uh, studio in the Imperial Palace. 
Um, there is not an example of one of these in either Beijing or Taipei. I think there's one in a Hong Kong museum, but that's about it. Uh, they made a few of these, but hardly any of them survived. And it originally had belonged to this fellow. This was the port. This is a portrait. This is Prince Gong, all right. And then it went over to this guy, who is a legendary collector, Mr. Barr, all right, Ab William Abel Barr. He died in 1959. And then eventually ended up with um, uh, Paul Bernat, a Boston collector. Um, he was a legendary collector. Most of his collection went into the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Um, they did auction some of his things at Sotheby's when he died. But he, he collected uh, Qing imperial porcelain. He and his brother owned a company together, a textile company. And his brother, I think his name was Edwin, collected early ceramics and they, they I guess they decided to do that so they wouldn't be competing with each other in their hobbies so so one couple Paul and Helen Bernat collected um, uh, imperial pieces and his brother and his wife collected uh, Ming and earlier Sung pieces both were unbelievably great collections and this piece uh, ended up uh, going to him but these uh, Femiel Jun uh, pouches uh, made of glass were extremely difficult to make successfully. Uh, the coloration on them, the enameling was just superb. This was done obviously like a like a like a little like a trinket pouch with a with a ribbon or bow around it, as a ruffled edge. Uh, just fantastic. It's, it's I forget what the estimate is, but it's 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 in the uh, uh, I think it's in the in the millions. Hold on a second here. See if they they print. I don't remember if they printed the estimate or not. They probably didn't, but I'm 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 guessing it's in the you know, five to ten million dollar range. All right. Uh, estimate upon red crest. Yeah, so it's probably five to ten million. And there's a picture of the rain mark on the bottom. Okay. This is really quite something. And this is not a big piece of glass. As you can see, it's seven inches in, uh, in uh, height. But the quality of work on it is just outstanding. And the question is, is, is there enough strength in the market to, um, to buy this? Because there, there's, not a, there's not a lot of peaking glass um, in the in the in the world in this caliber. So again, you may have people, you know, having a little trouble trying to figure out how much it's worth. All right, and then over here is another catalog. This is what I'm saying. It, it's it's this is sort of like the mother load of mother loads, and I don't know, you know, why it's all coming on the market now. But with some of the turmoil and the trade issues and the economic issues going on, um, I'm going to be really fascinated to see how much impact, if any, it has on all of this. Um, it'll, you know, everything always has some impact, but we'll see. And one of the pieces in this uh, is, is something I just think is great. This is a, a really, really fine uh, uh, Famille Rose. Uh, it's, it's three boys carrying a vase, Chin Lung, Mark and Period. And uh, they, they, they found records on these, and they estimate that they made around 50 of them, though very few of them survive because of, uh, because of the way they're made. They're extremely fragile but superbly well done. The facial expressions are great. The way the robes are done, meticulous. And of course, the vase itself is uh, done like uh, the way they did Chin Lung um, vases. All right, so we'll see how that does. The estimate on this is uh, 325 to $384,000. It measures around seven, a little over seven inches in height. And um, these have been documented. They know about these, and that helps often. Uh, you know, if, if if they were, if they know how many were made, and and uh, that kind of thing, because the the uh, imperial workshops did keep very good records um, much of the time, especially in the 18th century. And then getting over here, this is one of the things that's been getting a ton of attention. It is also an estimate upon request thing. Uh, it is a is a form of Chin Lung Moon Flash we've all seen many times, but. The quality of the decoration of this one is, is fairly head and shoulders above many of the others you've ever seen. And it is good size. It's almost 20 inches tall. But the work on this, and I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago just because it knocked me out when I saw it. The work on this is so tight, so even. The cobalt is so perfect. I love the handles. And then you have this, this uh, beautiful shower mark in the center. And then you have all the little precious scrolls and whatnot in the uh, radiating lotus panels coming out from it. And uh, you, you know, people uh, often don't think of it, but this, this is done exactly the way a sweet meat dish is done. And then at the bottom, you have this uh, very tidally drawn bat flying up um, um, uh, through the clouds. It's just a, a, an absolutely splendid thing. And um, probably, you know, there's it, it, estimate on request, but I would, I would, I'm just as a rough guess, maybe three to five million, maybe more. 
I don't know. Uh, very hard to estimate again because the, you, you, there aren't many examples like this one around. There's lots of blue and white moon flasks, and they always seem to sell for you know between uh, you know 750 and uh, 1.1 million somewhere in there, 1.2 million. Um, a pair of them sold at Bonhams a few years ago that were very very good, but not this good. And I think they brought a million nine. So this one, I, I'll be curious to see how it does. All right, and now over to. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Uh, 102. We're only going to look at one more thing in this catalog, this. Um, and the reason I put this in, this is not one of the really high estimated things in the sale. But it's a it's a Young Chen Mark and Period, um, you know, copper red enameled vase. It's only four inches tall, Meiping vase. But the color is absolutely amazing on this thing. The color is like a ruby. Uh, and it's full. Of, you, can, you can see they did such a good job photographing it. You can see the bubbles in the glaze very clearly here they are because the the light hits them against the dark red background and they refract beautifully so you can really see it uh, but this the color and the evenness of the color on this thing and the brightness of the red is quite a feat and they don't often get this clear and this fine and it's like I said, it's like a jewel. It's it's, it's you know it's bigger than a snuff bottle, but uh, uh, I'll be interested to see how it does. It's got an estimate of 103 to 154 thousand dollars. It is mark and period, and I can't think of another one quite this beautiful that I've seen any time recently. So we'll, this again will be interesting to see how it does. And then on to the last catalog here is part two of the Sir Kuo Wei Lee collection. And you may remember we did a video on this um, last October or so when they did part one. He was a very well-known um, Hong Kong banker. He was a big benefactor to his community. He was, uh, from what I read, he was just a great guy and he loved art. And uh, he made uh, a considerable fortune and began collecting. And he was very generous with his collection. He was always willing to loan it out, I guess, and share examples with institutions and people doing research and all that kind of thing. And this sale focuses uh, the main key, the key elements in this sale are, the, are, are his, now his jade collection and some very good Ming pieces, mostly, okay? But this is a really fine Jai Jing uh, uh, period uh, uh, a Rue Scepter, wonderful quality, uh, just a great example. And uh, then, and it's estimated at you know thirty-eight to fifty thousand dollars. We'll see how it does. Now, his estimates on some of these pieces also seem fairly uh, 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 friendly. We'll put it that way. And I think it's because they they're very serious about wanting to sell it all. And here you have this Young Lo period Ming dish. Uh, it's about fifteen inches in diameter. I think it is. Wasn't it that the height? I'm, I'm trying to remember because it's. Uh, 15 inches, yeah, it's a 15 inch example. Nice dish, barbed rimmed, beautiful condition. And it's got a fairly modest estimate, 100 and, uh, 190 to $250,000. That's not a crazy estimate for that. And uh, I'm really curious to see how that does. And then you get over here, they have things like this jade. Beautiful jade Dao, uh, 18th century. It's not marked, but it's a very rare form. Um, uh, this form in jade is extremely rare. And the color of the jade on this is very, very good. I always look at the color of jade. But this has this nice, even, um, uh, you know, greenish-white tone to it. But no inclusions. Perfectly done. Beautiful, beautifully shaped. And uh, we'll see how that does. All right. It's estimated at uh, 250 to 350,000, which seems like a lot for a piece that isn't mark and period. But it's it's because the form. The form is so rare. And um, and then you have page. Uh, 46, we'll hop over here, is this jade box, a quail box with cover, Qinlong period, again, two hundred and fifty to $380,000. It's about five inches in diameter, but uh, beautiful quality carving, very soft, very elegant, uh, uh, then ascending quail and one standing on the ground. And uh, we'll, we'll be very interested to see where that ends up going. And then we get over here. Now, this is something that's a bit of a surprise to me, and I, and I don't know if it's a typo or what it is, but there's a, uh, a peach bloom brush washer coming up right there, and it's got a very low estimate, four, six to $9,000, all right? Um, I, I, I have to think that meant they meant to say sixty to 90000 I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, um, I can't remember the last time I saw one of these go for that kind of price. But there it is. It has a very nice color, a uh, nice white interior. It's got the good speckles and it's marked in period. And why it's only estimated at that price, I don't know. Unless it's got a crack or something you can't see. 
and that would impact the price. But if it's perfect, um, I suspect that's going to do a good bit. And I can't imagine them putting a cracked piece in this catalog. So maybe it was just a typo. Who knows? And um, But a be another beautiful example. And then you get over here is this great jade octagonal vase with its cover, uh, uh, really finely done, chin lung period. And look at, look at the handle on top, that delicate little handle. And then these beautiful loop rings coming off the sides. And if you pull it in, you can very nicely see all the decoration, the characters on there, the phoenixes and one thing and another. And um, this is estimated at uh, 380 to $500,000. And I know it doesn't sound like these sound like they're really low estimates, but I don't think these are crazy estimates. All right. And then on to the basket. Uh, let's see the, the vase. Where, where is it? 95, page 95. Mm, mm, mm. There we go. This, this barbed vase, uh, barbed rim vase shaped like a lotus goo form. Again, notice the color. The color is perfectly even throughout it. It's about, uh, about nine inches, eight inches tall. Beautifully done. Last time it went through Sotheby's was around 14 uh, years ago or so, 15 years, 16 years ago. And um, it's estimated at 300 and 384 to 400, uh, 600,000. They gave this a wide ranging estimate. 384 to 640,000. And the reason is I suspect n n none of these have been on the market in a number of years um, in this shape and they had, they, they, they're all over the place trying to figure out how much it's worth. Uh, because that's a big spread. That's, that's it's, it's a 40% spread in price, but I can understand it. It's difficult to date, difficult to value. All right, and then there is this Ming Charger, um, which seems uh, also to have a fairly modest uh, estimate on it. This is a 19-inch Ming uh, Charger, barb rim charger with a beautiful center on it, uh, uh, $38,000 to $50,000. This is a big piece, big heavy piece, um, and and the glaze looks to be in very good shape. If you pull it in and take a good look at it, um, it looks to be in nice condition. I don't see any wear, a lot of wear anywhere. I don't see any damage to it. This line that you might see on the left side of the screen is the crease on the catalog page, not in the plate, uh, but really nice. And uh, again, seems like a modest estimate. Maybe not. Who knows? Maybe they know something we don't know, which is very possible. All right, and then lastly, we get over to here. here uh, a couple of things I just thought were pretty and very, very elegant. It's a pair of Yongchen. Uh, it is a pair, not just one being shown from different sides. Uh, Yongchen cup stands in blue and white, but done in the Ming style with this heap and pile effect on them. Uh, just really lovely. Just really lovely. And uh, on here. Here's another view of it, and you see the rain mark on the bottom. Again, that meticulous Yongchen rain mark, and uh, this very nice white, neatly, neatly trimmed foot. And you see the the way they did the uh, the, the these droplets or run uh, panels dropping down. Very, very fine. Um, and we'll see how these do. The estimate, as I said, was it was not a, doesn't seem like a crazy estimate. Sixty to ninety thousand for a pair. Pairs are always highly desirable, and these are beautifully done, just absolutely beautiful. And that's just, you know, I, I went through this pretty quickly, and it's taken me almost 40 minutes. Um, there is so much material here, uh, a lot of very high-end material, top-notch material. And if you, if you uh, enjoy this stuff and, and you want to learn and read about it, um, uh, Sotheby's did a great job in the descriptions. There are also some, I didn't have time to get into them, there's some very fine bronzes in some of these catalogs. Um, uh, big bodhisattvas, there's a, a very rare wooden um, a, a Buddha, there's a great bronze, a gilt bronze in particular, and you got to go through. And, and again, they've, they've done a, a great job in describing all of them. But we'll be very interested to see how this does next week. The sales start, I think, around the 7th or the 8th, and they'll run a couple of days. Um, so check them out. Um, check out the catalogs on bitemout.com. Um, come over and subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, give us a thumbs up here. Um, just so you know, thumbs up on here really help us. I keep getting things from YouTube saying, oh, you, you know, thumbs ups are good for you. So give us lots of thumbs up. So it helps our ranking, helps us um, get more people to find us. That's one of the ways Google, uh, through YouTube, um, uh, puts out their logarithms we're learning uh, it's always something and um, leave a comment and uh, we'll be back after this sale these sales complete and do a bit of an autopsy see how it all went I, I have a feeling that they're, they're going to do pretty well um, and we'll find out where soft spots are in the market okay
Have a great week, and um, we'll be back tomorrow with another the regular weekly video. But I wanted to get these done this week um, because I'd been saying I would. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.